afternoon, Faculty of Law. We are making an interview with Dr. Ima. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Ima, in your work, you identify the rule of recognition with validity, the criteria, and this is can view of in the decisions of the Supreme Court. Can you explain to us that? Um, how the how the rule of recognition and validity criteria relate? Yeah. Um, the rule of recognition is is a rule, and the, it's a rule that defines judicial duties. It defines how to go about making law. Um, there are rules that that constrain judges and empower legislators. The, they define the validity criteria. The validity criteria are just um, a list of properties that something has to have in, to count as law. So they're actually different. The rule of recognition is normative. It's, it is takes the form of a rule, but the criteria of validity is descriptive. You could say you could you you, you don't have to use um, terms like ought or should. Um, the way that you would express the the validity criteria would be something like this. X is a federal law in the United States if and only if it was enacted in accordance with the the, uh, the procedures outlined in the Articles of the U.S. Constitution and and uh, is consistent with the substantive uh, guarantees of rights in the amendments. Okay. In some of your essays, you warn us also that there is a moral language of the Constitution and there is no direct with us a moral norma. Uh, in the other words, we should not confuse moral language from other legal validity. Validity. Can you explain us that? Um, well, the, I think that the, the U.S. Constitution, at least, um, uses terms that are also okay. Legal talk and moral talk have a, have some words in common. For example, rights. Thank you. Um, obligation. Um, reasonableness. And what I think is, is going on in the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, for example, is in the Fourth Amendment, it, the Fourth Amendment protects citizens against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, what does reasonable mean? Well, that's actually a moral term. If, if, you, you, know, if you and I are having an argument and I say, be reasonable, reasonable mm -hmm. I'm not saying be rational. You know, I'm not saying you're contradicting yourself. I'm saying something because sort of yourself. like be fair. You're not being fair. You're not being reasonable. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's going on with the term reasonable in the Fourth Amendment or unreasonable mm -hmm. is that it's trying to incorporate the moral notion of reasonableness or unreasonableness. And the idea is... Um, uh, as far as constitutional interpretation is concerned, mm, mm, I, I accept Dworkin's theory. I think that those terms the, that have this moral content as well should be thought of as an attempt to incorporate the, the, the moral principles that define what is reasonable and what isn't into the Constitution and should be interpreted as such. Okay. And in some of your works, you got, uh, you got disagreement with Ken Greenwald about the improbability of, of major legal systems. What do you think about this approach? About his approach? Um, the, the improbability of? The, the improbability of, uh, of the major legal system. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The improbability of major legal system. What do you think about his approach? About his uh, approach of Ken Greenwald? Um, where Kent Green, Greenwald and I disagree is on how what um, we have a disagreement about what the rule of recognition in the United States is, and the disagreement is somewhat minor. Um, I'm not sure um, I understand what's meant by a uh, major legal system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to my knowledge, uh, the only time that uh, I, my work has ever engaged anything that uh, Kent Greenwald has done is when I, uh, I wrote a paper that tried to sh tried to identify what exactly the rule of recognition in the United States was is what the criteria of validity are and he has an alternative account we're very close together on our respective accounts but we disagree with respect to certain particulars that I think are theoretically important. Okay. And um, in most of your writings, you see the relation between law and morality. What do you think about law and approach? Um, I think 
Lon Fuller's Inner Morality of Law is probably best thought of as a um, as an account of the rule of law. Um, uh, the rule of law is is well. There are two ways to think about it. Um, first, I think I don't regard Lon Fuller's procedural principle, eight procedural principles, as being an, a morality that is internal to the concept of law that's inconsistent with legal positivism. Um, those eight principles just define what kinds of things you have to do with law in order for it to succeed in guiding behavior. If rules are secret, well, they, they can't guide behavior. Mm -hmm. If rules are constantly changing, they can't guide behavior. If rules are unclear, they can't guide behavior. So what uh, part of what he's doing there is, I mean, you can see those principles as just efficacy conditions. You know, in order for a law to be efficacious in regulating behavior, it has to have these, these eight principles. Um, and I agree with, with Lon Fuller on this. If you have a legal system where there's a wholesale, a total failure with respect to any one or more of these principles, then you won't have something that's properly called a legal system. So that's one uh, element of it. I also think that, however, that those efficacy conditions correspond with moral principles. It's a good thing, that a morally good thing that law be clear, right? We want people to be able to understand what the law is so that they don't get themselves into trouble with the, the, with the police. Um, now, I think he's also very, uh, I think it's very fruitful to understand um, Lon Fuller as giving an account of the rule of law. Um, there is this idea that governance by law is better than rule by men mm -hmm. and or rule by people. So there's this idea that law, governance by law, has some special moral properties that makes it preferable to, you know, just being governed by this or that person. Um, and the prince, and that's called the rule of law, right? The mm -hmm. rule of law is a property, is a moral property that the legal system should satisfy, and they can only satisfy that ideal if laws are clear, if they're applied consistently, if they don't change too much, if they're not applied retroactively. So, I think there's a lot that's right uh, in Lon Fuller. I think he's right in thinking that. Those eight principles are existence conditions for legal systems. Um, I also think that they have moral value, um, and that, in fact, that moral value, that those principles, um, the moral value that those principles have, flesh out this moral ideal of the rule of law. Yeah, and that's one of the topics that Ronald Working wrote on the Empire of Law. And um, another question, what do you think that is a more important legacy. Uh, what do you, what do you think? Uh, uh, are you agreed or not agreed with the theory of Ronald working on the importance of legacy? Wow, what's the most? Uh, how do I assess the legacy of Ronald Dworkin? Um, I mean, just about everything he's done is important. Ronald Dworkin, for example played as much as an, almost as important a role in shaping legal positivism. Well, he, he's played a more important role in shaping legal positivism than anybody, any positivist theorist other than Hart. Mm -hmm. Early on in Dworkin's career, his criticisms of legal positivism forced positivists to rethink positivism and, until it took, takes the form that it now takes. So. Dworkin's, part of Dworkin's legacy is that he contributed a great deal to positivism's um, reform, being reformulated and clarified. Um, the legacy that he leads with respect to uh, his theory of adjudication, uh, I think it's tr of tremendous importance. I think uh, his views about how judges ought to decide cases, abs on my view, I mean, absolutely right. and very important. Uh, there are few theories that could be more important, legal theories that could be more important than a theory that explains how judges morally should decide cases. Um, Ronald Dworkin was just a, a, a genius. Uh, 
just about everything he did will be read in a hundred years. My only disagreement with him is that his theory is his conceptual analysis of law is better than the positivist. That's my only disagreement with him. I read, every time I read Law's Empire, after about 30 pages, I think to myself, I have no business calling myself a legal philosopher. Ronald Dworkin is a legal philosopher. I'm just some hack. I mean, that book is breathtakingly beautiful for, for its grasp of the the entire landscape of law. It's pure genius. I, that doesn't mean I think it's right, but um, lots of geniuses. Um, being a genius doesn't always mean that what you have to say is right. Um, uh, Newton was a, a genius at physics, and Newtonian mechanics was accepted until Einstein came along. But just because Einstein was right and Newton wasn't doesn't make mean Newton wasn't a genius. He was. Okay. In one of your books, you work uh, with Richard Delgado, one of the major members of the critical race theory. What do you think about his theory? Um, I think in I think that the, the, the critical legal studies movement in, in general, um, when we start talking about uh, critical race theory, critical gender theory, uh, critical uh, queer theory, I mean, that stuff is extremely extremely important. Um, you know, as far as to the critical legal studies movement is concerned, the thing, I guess, the one claim that I have problems with is this idea that law is completely indeterminate in the sense that law is so filled with contradictions that you can get any results you want on any legal issue. That seems to me to be incorrect. I don't know if that's Richard Delgado's view. But um, the stuff on critical race studies, critical gender studies, extremely important. Fact is, the law is still racist, it's still sexist, and it still discriminates against gays. And any, anybody who argues that that's morally wrong is fighting the, the good fight as far as I'm concerned. We heard about you that your new book is almost in libraries, named the Rounds of Law. What are the Rounds of Law? Oh, that's I'm. That's actually Dworkin's term for criteria validity. Yeah. You know, what I wanted to do with that title was, um, it's a book that defends positivism, but I didn't. I wanted. I, I wanted to express the some of the key concepts in Dworkinian terms because. I didn't want to defend positivism by assuming positivist concepts. Um, putting it in the title is something of a an homage to Ronald Dworkin. Mm -hmm. um, it's my way of, you know, honoring him. Thank you very much for this brief interview, and uh, thank you for the mm -hmm. Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas de la UNAM. Uh, thank you for uh, for it's a pleasure to be here and um, it was a pleasure to have the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you for asking me to to um, ha have this interview. Good luck. judges and empower legislators. The, they define the validity criteria. The validity criteria are just um, a list of properties that something has to have in, to count as law. So they're actually different. The rule of recognition is normative. It's, it is takes the form of a rule. Can you explain to us that? Um, how, the, how the rule of recognition and validity criteria relate? Yeah. Um, 
the rule of recognition is is a rule, and the, it's a rule that defines judicial duties. It defines how to go about making law. Um, there are rules that that constrain. Good afternoon, Faculty of Law. We are making an interview with Dr. Ima. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Ima, in your work, you identify the rule of recognition with validity, the criteria, and this is can be of in the decisions of the Supreme Court. 